Ryan, if you actually look at the Fed fund futures, and I know it, some of our listeners may not realize, but there's actually a market for what people think the Fed is going to do over the next two years. If you look at that market, there is a 91% chance of a rate cut sometime next spring. And that's my point. Even if the Fed does hike one more time, which I don't think they'll do, it right. doesn't matter because the market's already thinking they're going to start cutting them. So it's kind of a temporary thing. And then in the meantime is kind of what argu arguments is like, okay, so you're getting 5% on a money market fund right now. Right. That might be a lot lower next year, which means that it might not be so smart to be sitting at a 5% money market or treasury right now. What are your thoughts on that? So for uh, some of my money management clients, actually today we bought three month T-bills. And I tell you why, we had um, some new money come into the fund and um, we allocated some of it to the Bullseye American Ingenuity portfolio. And then we decided to just put some of it in three month T-bills in case there's some volatility over the next couple of weeks, which you know is, is a fair assumption given what's happening or not happening in Washington, given the UAW, and just given this time of year. This is when bad stuff happens, September, October. So we save a little cash. We're in three-month T-bills. We get through that, and towards the end of the year, um, we start to put some more money to work. I don't think Bob would wait. <laughs> <laughs> what? You just buy the stocks now, buy them all now? Well, you know, we've had, uh, what, we're eight, they're down 8% from the, the high of the S&P. Yeah. Um, we've been in a big boom and bull market since a year ago, right? Um, you're, you're one of the few people have I watched on uh, national news that recognizes that. Uh, so, you know, when we get down another two, 3%, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I think the valuations are pretty good right here. Yeah, I do too. And that's why, you know, we, we, we put a big chunk of change to work today for a brand new client, uh, which always, oh, nice. always feels good. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, you mentioned the, the S&P being down, whatever it is, six, seven, eight percent from the July high. I'm down more than that um, because, you know, I'm a growth investor and my names tend to move. You know, the Nasdaq is down 10, 11, 12 percent uh, from the high. You look at some of those Kathy Wood ARK ETF um, <laughs> names and they're down a lot more than that. So, um, you know, I think it's just a question of being balanced and, and, and thoughtful. And that's that's what I, I try to do on behalf of the clients. I think what Adam's really trying to say is, you know, he's got more cowboy money at play than the S&P 500. Um, but no, no, in all seriousness, I think, you know, one thing we, you and I have been two, maybe the biggest bulls on Wall Street. Yes. <laughs> so consistently. consistently, which, you know, the, the, the actual quote unquote experts right. have been dead wrong here. And now you're starting to hear the drum beat again, markets down a couple percentage points from the high. It's like, okay, well, we're definitely, we were wrong all year, but we're definitely going into recession next year. Yeah. You're gonna go to cash, sit in that 5% treasury. That drum beat is so loud and I'm so <laughs> tired of hearing it because those people are so wrong. I think employment is the single most important factor right now in why this economy continues to chug forward. I'm not saying that it's great that we're all making more money than we've ever made before because inflation's reduced our buying power. But what I am saying is that we still have a near record number of people employed. And they are actually making the highest gross adjusted income ever. Maybe not as much as they were in inflation adjusted uh, terms uh, a couple of years ago. But yeah. when you have that many people making that much money and they're out there spending it, you know, that is good for the economy, which is ultimately good for earnings. And, and so I think this notion that we're going to suddenly turn into a recession is just is wrong headed. Yeah. Well, they also couple the fact that uh, earnings have come in way better than expected. You know, you've got the strong employment market, but inflation's still hot. So uh, economists would kill me if they if they <laughs> if there are any economists they might, Adam. listening. They might. They're going to kill me for saying what I'm about to say, okay. uh, because this is not how you actually do statistics. But back of the envelope, just, you know, for 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 all of us here uh, having this conversation, if you just amongst average, us yeah, amongst yeah. us girls and guys, if you just average the consumer prices, you know, index, yeah. CPI, the producer price index, PPI, and uh, personal consumption expenditures, PCE, those three measures of inflation, and then all the different ways that they're quoted month over month, year over year, core, non-core, et cetera. If you average all that together, what you'd find is that the um, inflation number is somewhere around 3.6. Uh, and it was, by the way, 3.3 three about a month or two ago before we had the uptick in oil prices. So 3.6 starts to get towards that Fed number, yes, right? Under Which three. is 2%. Yeah, yeah. Um, which I don't think they're going to get to. And, and again, that's my shorthand way of looking at inflation, which isn't entirely fair, but I think it's a reasonable ballpark. And remember, producer prices were over 11 consumer prices were over nine. So if you average all the stuff together and you can get to the mid threes, 
with a 2% goal, that's pretty good. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. I mean, I think that's the whole idea of moderating inflation and a labor market that's just like not going to fall off a cliff because we have a labor shortage. And I think that's like one of the biggest arguments that you and I have had is like, yeah. how can you go into recession when you have full employment? It like it just doesn't make sense. Right. I think Maria hates the fact that when when she does the uh, market segment with the two of you on either side of her, that she knows exactly what you're going to say. She said like she's so used to listening to negative nabobs all the time. It's like, what's wrong with you two guys? Right. <laughs> so <I think> <laughs> right. <laughs> He's like, oh, yeah, 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 you guys have been right. I'm sorry, you're right. Uh, yeah, okay, forget about what those economists say. But you know, I, I think, I don't who listens to the Federal Reserve? I mean, they've been wrong so many times for so long. Um, you know, I, I just, these economists, they kind of, there's a, like a secret club. They all have to back each other with their wrong, you know, right. wrong reviews. I mean, it's just uh, pretty surprising, I think. Yeah, uh, the Fed, you know, it's amazing. If you remember before COVID, and I know that seems like a, a world away, and it was in many ways, but before COVID, inflation was like 1.5%. And the Fed was trying to get it to two. And do you remember when Jerome Powell said, you know, if inflation starts to uh, heat up, we'll let it run hot. <laughs> you know? He sure oh, did. Yeah, he sure did. <laughs> I mean, yeah. wow. 9%, yeah. And that's your point, Bob. They, yeah. they've, they've gotten a lot wrong. Yeah. I think they're in the process of starting to get it right. They might actually engineer a soft landing, but you're right. They've gotten a lot wrong. You know, Bob's kind of a hippie from the 70s, so it's like, don't trust the man, don't trust the Fed. I think it's in the same vein, Bob. What do you think? Yeah, it's something like that, right? Uh, <laughs> but, you know, we when we started paying capital, um, you know, in the teeth of the great financial crisis, right? We, we launched the firm. Everybody was against investing in the U.S. stock market. You know, they didn't, it's like, oh, my God, you got to stay in cash because things are so bad, they're never going to get better. Um, and I think it was probably the lowest exposure to equities in the last 20 years that we saw the average investor. Now, I think people are a little too greedy uh, in that they're not investing in the right companies. It's like the mega, mega cap seven is the only thing they invest in. We see, you know, we see a lot of portfolios we review every, every week that come in and it's the concentration in those just mega tech stocks. I think it's just, uh, it's just surprising. Uh, when you look at, you know, how far we've gone in 15 years. So, you know, I, I, I believe that diversification is the only hedge against being wrong. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, we run into a lot of that, you know, when we, um, when we try to onboard somebody new or we meet somebody new, Adam, are you seeing the same thing? You're seeing people with this, this, this incredible concentration yes. in, um, you know, the same seven stocks and, and not willing to diversify, believing that they're going to miss out on something? Well, I own those same seven stocks myself. Um, well, not to be clear, you don't have your whole portfolio no, there, do you? No, of course no. not. Uh, there are 43 names in the Bullseye American Ingenuity portfolio. And while those big guys are weighted up around uh, 4%, so, you know, they're 28%, just to make the math easy, 28% of the portfolio, seven names at 4% each. Um, the rest of the portfolio um, is, is well diversified, um, 72 names or rather 72 percentage points across, you know, another 35 names. And so those names are two to 3%. And, and that way, you know, if, if one of them, if one of my little growthy names that no one's ever heard of, you know, um, yeah. trading around six bucks that maybe one day trades at 60 bucks, like Splunk. right? Uh, well, we, Splunk was a takeout. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. In fact, I rewrote that for subscribers. Yeah. Uh, and when it gapped up after earnings, and I said, I'm reiterating my buy. At, at 52 week highs, which always makes people nervous, and then it gets taken out. Well done, well played. At one, well, yeah, but it got taken out too cheap, um, which is a, an interesting point, by the way, guys, because the takeout multiple on Splunk was six times sales. And, wow. uh, you know, as I said to my subscribers, this is way lower than it should be. This should be taken out at 11 or 10 times sales, but when you have interest rates up at 16 year highs, that compresses multiples. And, right. and that's an, yeah. an important, um, an important uh, force right now yeah. in, that's keeping uh, stocks sort of um, at bay. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I actually, though, I'm gonna steal you know, a line from you. Um, well, first of all, we hear a lot about, you know, Chris is concerned about Bidenomics. He can't sleep at night. That's all he thinks about, you know, how the account, how <laughs> Biden is, you know, taking the economy off a cliff, that's just a joke. Um, but, you know, I, I think the bottom line is what we're looking at is margins should start to expand because of American ingenuity, right? You're starting to look at how 
AI is going to increase and you know improve productivity. Uh, all automation. You were just at this factory. Oh yeah, that was. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, we're talking about how you were in a fully automated factory. Was it in upstate New York or Pennsylvania? It's a company called GXO Logistics, right. which is the largest third-party logistics provider, pure play. <laughs> A logistics provider in the world. So, for example, we got to put a clip of that up, by the way, as you're talking. These yeah, robots, yeah. I called it yeah. a robot ballet. And guys, um, <laughs> I mean, you should see these things moving around on the factory floor, and they never bump into each other because you know they're coordinated by uh, an artificial intelligence, um, uh, like 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 air traffic control that you know keeps planes from hitting each other. It's crazy. These yeah, robots yeah. are zipping around the floor, gathering all this stuff. The entire warehouse is automated. It's like the Jetsons. So it can yeah. it, it can function at night. Uh, it can function without lights. It can function 24 seven, of course. You don't need to air condition it. You don't need to heat it. Um, you don't need to pay um, uh, uh, benefits. Uh, you only need one shift because, you know, robots work 24 seven, right? And um, so you can improve uh, productivity uh, many, many fold. And it's very exciting. Um, Symbotic is another company, S-Y-M. They are um, automating all 47 distribution facilities for Walmart. And so, you know, you think about what's happening at the UAW and they want all these, you know, 30 and 40 percent raises. Well, they can see the writing on the wall. Robots are, are taking jobs on logistics. They're taking jobs on uh, assembly lines and with good reason, because, yes, that gets at your point, Ryan, which is increased productivity. That is uh, artificial intelligence at work. That is technology at work. That is American ingenuity. There you go. I can see it for next week's podcast uh, starring Robo Robert and Robo Ryan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. We always said that like automation, AI can't fix Bob, you know, can't replicate Bob's hair, but that's another story altogether. That's for sure. But you know what? If you look at you know, when the internet was, when the internet came online, and and you know there's all the excitement back in the '90s about you know which company to buy, and you know they're they're basing it. Uh, you know, was it a PE ratio? It was you know eyeball ratio, right? How many eyeballs did they have on their websites? How we're pricing the stock? You know, it was a wild west. But it's, it turns out every company benefited from the internet. Every company became an internet company. So, isn't it? Uh, doesn't it make sense, guys, that AI? is going to improve productivity at every company. Is it every company a tech company now? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Totally. No, I think I think that's that's kind of the theme here. It's like we call it the roaring 20s. It's because we're going to solve our labor shortage. It's going to be AI, automation. That's going to solve productivity. Right? Yeah. It's the two huge catalysts. And why we're optimistic on the whole decade. You know, forget just like next year. Um, I mean, it's going to, the reshoring trend is going to be, it's going to keep happening because we're going to be able to do it with robots. We don't need as many people to do to manufacture like we did back in the day. And that's why we lost all those manufacturing jobs. Well, here's a great example in our business. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, we used to go into dad's office and dad, you used to write out all your trades and put them into a pneumatic tube. You know, now it's just yeah. a push of a button. <laughs> Bob still does it that way, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> hey, old habits are hard to break, guys, you know? <laughs> no, it's true. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm reminded of a of a, a thing that my, my longtime mentor used to say for, um, I worked for this guy for 15, 20 years. He was a former vice chairman of uh, Lehman Brothers. And he would always in an interview ask a question. And the question that got you the job, if you answered it correctly, was how do you make the most amount of money on Wall Street? And the answer he was looking for was find a theme and leverage it. And so we've just talked about a couple themes over the past 20 years. Bobby, you're saying every company needs to be an internet company. Well. Yes, you're right. In the same way that every company had to become a dot-com company in 2000. Yes. And in 2005, learned to become an e-commerce company. And then yep. somewhere around 2012, 13, every company had to become a cloud company. And then every company had to become a data analytics company. And now every yep. company is becoming an artificial intelligence company. And these are powerful themes. And so I think my job as a portfolio manager is to... Um, to figure out how to best leverage these themes in the words of my old boss. Um, you know, how do you make the most amount of money on Wall Street? Find a theme and leverage it. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's, to, to Bob's point, like that's a theme that every company is gonna benefit from. And if you take the Magnificent, that Magnificent Seven out of the picture, I mean, valuations are pretty reasonable right now. I mean, you're not looking at a very expensive market when you take those major seven stocks out of the indice. In fact, I think the equal weight spread right now between the equal weight and the top seven names in the S&P 500 is the widest spread 
since right before the tech bubble burst. Well, that's the thing. And again, guys, that's why I'm so surprised that you're still on television. Because, you know, the, you know why? I mean, if you look at the, you know, the message they're putting out there, it's just like, you know, it's negativity. All the time. It's like they, it belies that, you know, when they look at the numbers and you see the earnings estimates are going up, you see the productivity has got to go up because of AI. Um, but again, they just want, you know, they just do this fear mongering where, I don't know what three quarters of the people in this country think our country's going down, right? Like we're going out, you know, the country's doomed. Um, but you know, it's 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 almost as if these economists, these other folks that they put on national television, don't read. You know, they don't look, they don't study. It, it's you know, it, it blows my mind. That's a really good point. That I remember a couple of weeks ago uh, on our last podcast, we talked about how the uh, the press does a great job of taking great news and making it bad news. But good news yeah. is good news. But that's how they get us to pay attention, right? Yeah, you true. know if. If, if, if you turn on the news and they say, and it's another beautiful day and everything's <laughs> great, then you don't, you don't need to listen to them. But if, nah, if they true. can somehow find something that you hadn't seen, A, they sound smarter. Yeah. And then if they can actually spin it into something that scares you, you really pay attention. And if you pay attention, they have more eyeballs. Yeah. And if they have more eyeballs, they can sell more ads. And if they sell more ads, they make more money. So it's just a big money game. That's yeah. all they're doing but so unprofitable for an investor. No, I don't touch media stocks. Yeah. You know, I'll sum it up for you guys. You know, if you watch, if, you know, I, I watch, you know, Fox Business and I watch CNBC because, you know, you know, our, our guys are on there, you're on there, Adam. And you know what the number one commercial is that supports those stations are gold commercials. Right? Oh, no. <laughs> you never see, you never see, well, you know, you should buy Apple, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you know, you don't see a commercial promoting Apple. It's promoting gold and gold coins. Where no, people, nobody's made any money in gold other than the people <laughs> that are selling gold. Um, maybe a, you know, that, that could be, you know, part of our investment strategy is like, let's take the commercials that promote an investment, short that investment and go along, you know, whatever we like. The only problem, Bob, is you just ruin gold as a sponsor for our podcast. So oh, now we're geez. all going to be poor. Thanks, oh, man. Oh, no. So, Adam, what are your thoughts on gold? I know you're not a big lover, so I might as well get your thoughts on record. There's no American ingenuity in a chunk of metal. Um, <laughs> so, no, I, I'm not a gold investor. What I do tell, my um, newsletter subscribers, because I, I, I do write a paragraph on uh, every week for them on just the big picture, stocks, bonds, oil, gold, and the dollar, right? Because I think you have, you know, you have to have a view on each of those, and the view is three sentences. And, and my three sentences on gold, let's see if I can actually count three sentences here, um, are uh, gold, gold is a range trade. Two. You buy it at 1600 <laughs> you sell it at 1900 Three. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> revert, to, revert to one. Yeah. 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 That makes it easy. I, I, gold doesn't excite me. And, and, you know, actually, one of my partners, um, longtime partners in a, in a hedge fund uh, that I was part of um, years ago, um, was a big believer in the notion that you want to buy price makers, not price takers. In other words, like a technology that. company that creates something sets the price at which it wants to sell. Whereas mm -hmm. if you are a commodity yeah. company, you know, a miner or you're an oil drill or whatever, you just have to take the price that the futures market gives you. So price taker versus price maker. You right. want to be long you price makers. You can't control commodity prices. Yeah. That's one thing we know. And, yeah. and gold is the ultimate price <clears throat> well, taker. I guess our ambition as professional fishermen just went out the window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I once got a fortune that said uh, hobbies make bad vocations. So there you go. <laughs> um, you know, another another question talking about commodities. I think this is a big question on a lot of investors' minds right now. Is no one was talking about hundred dollar oil like two months ago, but all of a sudden, magically, because oil's at ninety dollars a barrel, as we're recording this, it's obviously going to hundred. And I wonder now, because we've had such a big swing in oil, maybe it's time for oil to go back down. So I feel like I'm doing too much talking here, but I, I can actually speak to that and then and then I'll zip yeah. it so no, 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 Bob the, and Chris can get in. So well, that's right. good. Yeah, yeah. You say so. <laughs> um, so I began my career as an oil trader. That's right. Oh. And uh, had a ball. I traded um, jet fuel, and it, it fascinating um, market. It was like the Wolf of Wall Street back then, guys. Adam's got stories. <laughs> There's some fun <laughs> stories from yeah trading oil. Uh, yes, 20, 25 years ago, um, and. Uh, what I will tell you about oil is that it is a self-correcting mechanism. Um, if you ever heard the expression, the cure for low prices is low prices. The Bobism, yeah. Yeah, or, or the cure for high prices is high prices. In other yeah. words, um, when prices get really high as they are right now, yeah. uh, you know, 90 to 100 bucks, all the marginal 
wells out there are suddenly profitable. So if you're a driller, you sort of brush off all the old wells and say, okay, fire them up. Yeah. We're making money on that one, you know, because it's above 72 and the ones that weren't profitable until 80, well, we're making money on those. So in other words, as a producer, you start producing more. Great but point. as you produce more, that increased supply pushes the price down. Hence the expression, the cure for high prices yeah. is high prices and vice versa on the downside. Um, you know, if, if oil gets cheap, you just shut down your wells and you don't produce and then there's less supply and that brings the price up. So oil is a self-correcting mechanism. And I think that, that the, the range that you trade for oil is 60 to 90. And so I, so would, be, I would be a seller of, in fact, I think I'm gonna sell my three year energy holding. It's my only price taking position and that is energy yeah. transfer which is the largest operator of sure. uh, pipelines it still yields nine percent but you know i bought this thing at three bucks in the hole it's now trading at 14 which is my target i always sell half when it gets to a target i think i'm just going to sell yeah. the whole thing because if oil comes down that stock's going back to 10 bucks yeah. and you know declare that, victory that also makes me think of the overall economy what a boon if we start seeing oil prices come down we know inflation is still starting to moderate that could be a huge catalyst for the markets to go higher before the end of the year right there yes and in the meanwhile in the near term uh because oil prices are higher you might actually destroy some demand which might actually ultimately help the inflation scenario right you 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 you, you may not drive as much Airfares go up more, so you may not take that extra flight. You know what I mean? And yes. so you might see a little spending in the near term come down, which would be just fine. Yeah, 100%. You know, guys, that's why I always say that, you know, investing is so counterintuitive, right? You, you watched Jerome Powell last week and talked about the, you know, the Federal Reserve was testifying, you know, about what was going on and, and they, they, they paused. And then the SEP report, the SEP report came out. They said, oh, my goodness, they're only going to cut twice next year, not four times. Right? They're only going to be 50 <laughs> basis points, not 100 basis points, because the economy is going to be too strong. And the market sold off. Who sells out of the market because the economy is going to be too strong? I mean, crazy. it makes no <laughs> sense. Right? It's crazy. Yeah. Well, you it know, so we've joy. all become way too smart, Bob. I mean, they're like <laughs> way too many people trying to think, you know, way too far in the future, if this, then that. And they get three steps too far ahead of themselves. Yeah, that sounds like every analyst on Wall Street. Yeah. yeah. Like what could go wrong five steps down the line? Right. Yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, it's like, oh my God, it's horrible news. GDP growth is going to be double what we thought it was going to be. Yeah. That's horrible. Horrible. Yeah, yeah. Unemployment's lower than we thought it was going to be. Like terrible news. Sell I mean, everything. That's where we're kind of we're at right now, right? The news yeah. is so good that they can only spin it as like this is negative. Yeah. Um, and yeah, clearly it's not negative. This is always good news when the economy's growing and people have jobs. Period. Yes, period. Yeah. And the market. Yeah. The market is just cruel. I mean, we made fun. We I don't know, all year long on this podcast. We've been making fun of the perma bears, you know, like, right. like Mr. Like Wilson, Wilson over at Morgan Stanley <laughs> and, you know, some of these other f folks. And then finally, when we got the 4,600, right after they were calling for 3,100, you know, like a drumbeat every week, every month, they're on television. Uh, we get the 4,600 and they finally capitulate. Right. And the market goes into its correction. I mean, talk about how cruel the market is. I mean, these poor guys, like, oh, we finally got it right and we capitulate and now we have egg in our face twice. So it's just. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least we've got a good contra indicator. If Morgan Stanley says buy, you want to sell. And if they sell, sell, you want to buy. I think we just came up with a new font. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the anti-American ingenuity fund. <laughs> Something like that. And of course, you know, and, and, and a lot of people are very cynical, right? I mean, poor Jim Cramer's on TV all the time. Um, and he talks about a lot of stocks. So they, they create an ETF. It's one long Jim Cramer ideas and one short Jim Cramer idea. So you don't want to get too popular, right? You just, <laughs> it's true. you know, this, the street uh, crucifies you what, what, no matter what you do. But, you know, it, it's just so simple, right? You, you, you buy good companies, you buy you diversify your portfolio. You're not going to be 100 percent right. Not even Warren Buffett, you know, picks winners 100 percent of the time. I think he said, uh, you know, he's had like 10 winners out of the 500 or 400 companies he's invested in, you know, that real grand slam. So it's, you know, it's 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 very hard. But you know, trying to analyze great companies and on top of that, time the market. I mean, it's come on, that's it's, it's such a fool's errand. Oh, a fool's errand. Yeah, no, I, I learned that, that lesson. I won't say early in my career. I had to I had to make enough mistakes <laughs> last week over several years before I finally adopted the notion uh, time in the markets, not timing the markets. Amen. Big difference. Yeah. Well, I mean, the other thing is like dividends are something like 40 percent of your return long term. So just compounding dividends 
is right. a huge part of it. So this being in, a, in the market, out of the market, and missing that compounding effect is tremendous over time. And by the way, if you're not in a tax advantaged account, you know, if it's an after tax account, uh, the stock's got to go down, you know, whatever, 20, depending upon your, your you know, your capital gains. Your, yeah. Your, your, um, what am I trying to say? Your, your tax rate. You know, stock's got to go down 20% or more just, you know, to justify the sale that you made because you're going to have to pay taxes. Yeah. You know, one of the things, it, it just to <laughs> codify human behavior, you know, you look at the revenue that the government's bringing in, it's dropped dramatically this year because they had such a big boost last year from people panicking out of the market because it went down. Um, now, because we had been in a big booming bull market, you know, which we always are, uh, you know, they, they, they took a lot of capital gains, so they had to pay income tax on that. I mean, it's just, that's insult to injury, right? Yeah. So it, it just shows you how human behavior and investing is more emotional, you know, than it is, you know, using that gray matter in your, in your brain. Yeah. And, you know, we're all guilty of it. I mean, I certainly am. You know, if I some morning wake up and I check futures and, and they're down a percent and a half, I, I then go to my Bloomberg and I look, okay, which of my names is down the most pre-open? Oh my God, why is it down seven or eight percent? There's no news, yes. you know, and it makes me kind of sick yeah. to my stomach. But I have to remind myself, you know, that that's that's just the game, and it's pre-open, and you know, we open and oh look at that, a name that was down eight percent pre-market yeah. suddenly is only down three, and by noon it's kind of back to flat. You just say, okay, all right, all right. <laughs> Well, Adam, you know Ryan's a perma bull, so if you're ever feeling uh, feeling a little bad about it, just pick up the phone and call him. That's right. I thought That's right I was here. a perma bull, and, and Ryan takes it to another level. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you know what, Adam? I mean, you're, you're managing people's money, so it's you know that's an added pressure, right? It's one yeah. thing for your own portfolio, um, but then it's like you have to you have to manage, you know, your own emotions because you know you're, you're you have to answer to your clients. Plus, you have to help them to manage their emotions. Yes. Um, you know, and it's um, you know I I can tell you that a few occasions where, where people have panicked and, you know, basically said, get me out. I don't care what you say. Uh, and then they come back two days later and go, why did you let me do that? It's like, well, wait a minute. You know, I'm in a regulated industry. Right. Um, you know, it's not like I can say, oh, I, I didn't do it because, you know, I'm your friend or, you know, I'm your advisor. You know, two days later, now I got a lawsuit, right? So, you, you yeah, know, it's, it, you know, investors have to understand this, this industry is highly regulated. And if somebody gives you an order, you got to execute. So it's, Managing that emotion, you know, that emotion to that, you know, it's like that flight or or run fight or flight, fight or flight. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. it's like it's so much easier to, to run. But then, you know, and then you put your hat, you know, you put your thinking hat back on going, wait a minute, this is the best. This is what I've been hoping for. Right. Yeah. Um, and you hear that all the time. It's like, you know, I don't want to invest in the market. The market's too high. And then when you get the correction, well, I, I don't want to put any money in there. You know, so it's it's it, the emotions are just amazing. Um, and, you know, for years, people would ask me, you know, it's like my son or my daughter wants to, you know, pursue the industry that you're in. You know, what do you what do you recommend they, they, they study at, at university, Bob? Should they go and study economics? Should it be a finance major? And I say, oh, no, no. Make sure they study abnormal psychology. They'll be perfect. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> so, you know, they'll make a fortune for them and their clients. Um, so it's, you know, it is, it is, it's, you know, it's because it, it, when you look at the history of the markets, right, you go the last hundred years, we're up 75% of those years, right? Yeah. So yeah. 25 years down, 75 years up, what are the odds you're going to pick the one yeah. year? Right. You know, yeah, the in uh, industry is always bearish. Yeah. And the odds are against you to be bearish. That's the, one of the greatest ironies. That is incredibly yeah. ironic. And, and you know, bears always sound smarter than bulls because, yes. you know, it's as yeah. though they've seen something that none of us gullible bulls have seen. But uh, that is just, um, that is just so wrong for for all the reasons you just said, Bob. But you know what, Adam, I th I, and I think that's what it is. I think when, you know, when you're bearish, when you're negative, you come across as like, I'm trying to help you, right? If right. you come across positive and you sound oh, yes. Pollyannish, yeah. uh, it's not like, oh, you're trying to sell me something, right? So, you know, yeah. when, yeah, right. when I point. listen to you and I listen to Ryan and you guys you come across, it's like, you know, some of, the, some of the people, their viewers are going, oh, they're just trying to sell us their fund or their services. They're not really bullish, right? Um, I don't think that's the way it comes across. I think it's it's the only real advice I see on these shows. I mean, if you watch these financial shows, it's all about why you shouldn't be invested right now. anti investing <laughs> yeah. 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 Where, you know, I own all the Adam stocks, but I sold them last week. You know, I, I don't own them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, so I, I worked for another guy who um, 
he had to be right every moment of the day. So if he bought oh. something right at you know 9.30 on the open and he's up by 12, he feels like right. a hero. But if it's down by one, that same position, he feels like, ah, oh, well, why didn't I sell it at 12 noon? Now, I, now I'm, I'm an idiot. And, but then if it goes back up by three, well, you know, I stuck with it. And, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come it's on. Insanity. You yeah. drive yourself absolutely yeah. mad. That sounds like a recipe for sleepless nights. Oh, yeah, yeah. which is which is why, um, yeah, I, I, I was a trader early in my career and, 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 and I gave that up <laughs> for, uh, for uh, analysis and long-term investing. And I sleep much better and I, I think I make better decisions. Besides, we know those that uh, day trade, it's like uh, your friends who go to the casino and they're always winning. And like, how can you always be winning if these uh, you know, multi-billion dollar casinos are built? So they always tell you about when they win, not when they lose. Oh, so true. Yeah. And why do they have so many lost carry forwards? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we all have a few of those from last year, I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you're always right, there's no risk. All right, it's the hidden facts of finance. Random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Adam, we'll give you the first one. Let's hear it. Only about half of U.S. households now pay for traditional TV, down from more than 90% in 2010. Cancellations are accelerating and margins are falling. Have you cut the cord yet? Uh, no, I'm still one of the... Um idiot 50 percent <laughs> i spend 221 dollars a month wow. for my spectrum uh cable and i tried giving it up and i just got so annoyed uh because i couldn't get sports yes i mean that's that's what hooks you in and you know especially you say oh well wait football season you could get the nfl sunday pack you know what look i don't I, it's just too hard so yeah i spend 221 bucks for well it's cable and internet combined yeah it's well, a lot they thank you for, for yeah. them a lot. Yeah. So. All right, Bob, 50% of children born after 2004 will live to more than 100. 10 years ago, 12% of the population was over 65. In the next 10 years, an estimated 26% will be older than that. And I thought, this is going to be an incredible market. Hey, Rye, you know what? There's a chance I can go back and be born after 2004. I want to live to 100. Actually, I feel like I'm 100 now. I don't really want to experience that. So I'm kind of glad that uh, I'm not born after 2004. But, you know, truth be told, guys, you know, everyone's living longer. And, you know, life expectations go up because we're healthier. We're, we're better educated. You know, we people exercise. You know, genetics are on, you know, on your side. And I think that that's really the best case you can make, not just for investing, but investing properly based on longevity. And that's where planning comes in. I see so many folks out there who don't have a plan who, you know, let's face it, planning's boring. Nobody wants to do it. Um, it's a necessary evil. It's like budgeting. It's like dieting. You got you to plan. Preach it, Bob. Chris, all right, employees globally work almost a day at home per week. The number is greater in Canada, the United Kingdom and the U.S., and lowest in Asia and France. Chris should be bringing the numbers uh, down for the U.S. and the fact he sails like every other day. Well, and, you know, add to the fact that I was just sailing in Canada, you know, it just uh, <laughs> increases that number. No wonder those numbers are so low for working in the office. <laughs> but, you know, good Does thing Chris is... ever come to the office, Ry? <laughs> I, I did get a waterproof it, Bluetooth no. installed on my catamaran so I can talk to clients while I'm racing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, Adam, man, thanks for having me on the show today. It was awesome. Oh. Great conversation. We'll do it again soon. Oh, yeah. Bob, Chris, thank you guys. I really yeah, thanks, appreciate being on with you. See you again. Yeah. Hey, and if you like this podcast, love this podcast, you can subscribe on YouTube right now. You can click the like. If you like this episode, you can click that notification bell to be updated every week of our new content. You can subscribe on Spotify and on iTunes. Please give us that five-star rating. Leave us a comment. Tell everyone how much you love the pain points of wealth. That's it for this week. Stay loose and keep an open mind.